This is Greg Lawson, the Paranormal Detective. You're listening to Dead Creepy Podcast. This is something that um, has been in my mind recently. I don't know if you've been following any of the latest sightings in Chicago of like a Mothman creature. Right. And yeah. and, and it's, you know, it's all happening. It's like history repeating itself and, and they're, they're coming in thick and fast and... Um, there are several reports being made to move on, and um, it, just these sightings of huge. Some people are saying owls, some people are saying bats or Mothman, but all around the Chicago area. So you get one sighting, then you get another, then another. Before you know it, I think we're up to seven or eight sightings at the moment in the last three or four weeks. Um, so it, this could be this phenomenon again where people are jumping on the bandwagon for whatever reason it's hu human nature yes there was a uh, a red panda that had escaped from a zoo i don't remember which zoo it was uh but uh they were really you know concerned about it and they put it out on the news so all these people were reporting this red panda all over the place well come to find out red panda was actually never left the zoo and it left oh. uh, just in another habitat um, and so it really lends, you know, it, it begs the question, what's going on? Right? You yeah. Know, um, when, you're, when you're an investigator, you, you yourself have a certain level of credibility or non-credibility. Mm. And uh, you can actually be a liar and a bad person and still conduct a good investigation. And your investigation can stand on its own. You know, you can uh, avoid the whole political thing of the of assassination through, you know, the political means. Just saying, oh, don't pay attention to their investigation. They lied about this, or they, uh, you know, don't have any credibility. They, you know, they were sorting fruit at the grocery store before they became a paranormal investigator. They know nothing about <laughs> investigation. Yeah. Well, you know, as long as your investigation holds water, as long as you use industry standards and best practices in your investigation, whatever you come out with is what you come out with. Yeah. Your, your investigator credit credibility comes from your training, from your experience, from your research, especially using interdisciplinary research as far as you're not just looking at the guy that wrote the paper on how to use a K2 meter. Yeah. You're, you're looking at the guy that wrote the, the, the report on uh, electromagnetic spectrum and how it affects people inside of a residence that is wrapped, you know, in a, a electrical wires. Uh, you know, like as like a house, you get electrical wires yeah. everywhere. Does that do that? So, what you find in your investigation is inconsequential. It is the process that is more important than the outcome that you reach. Mm. Uh, so, when you first go into an investigation. You know, is your purpose to support the haunting or is your investigation to identify uh, the phenomenon that led to the experience that's being reported? I fall back on a thing called the alpha, what I call the alpha report. Who is the first person that experienced this? As you can go in uh, to an investigation, I did one, it took me about a year uh, there's a thing called the, the there's a there's a story in Westlake, Texas called the Ghost Wagon of Westlake, and it is a a wagon filled with cotton, uh, and it's got an old man and a dog, and it's being pulled by two horses, team of horses, and this has been reported to be seen on a area called Camp Craft. It's a it's a road that goes through the Eanes School District. And it's in the uh, hills of Westlake, if you can imagine, uh, you know, scrubby cedar trees, lots of rock uh, and very little prairie grass. Uh, and there's a, 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 you know, a stream. And in, in certain times of the year, there's uh, fog that comes out of the stream and you can see this wagon go through the fog, mm. supposedly. So that's the story. So I look into the story 
uh, and the story actually, that story actually originates from uh, a tale that some kids told in the 1960s. And these kids were actually out at the old Eanes schoolhouse that has a completely different haunted history. And they said that they saw this. Mm-hmm. Well, if you reach, if you were, reach back, some kids right prior to that saw an old man with a dog walking over a hill and they went to see what he was doing and the, the old man and dog had disappeared. And then there's another story of in the 1880s of a cotton farmer going to Austin with his load and being uh, uh, ambushed either by Comanche Indians or highwaymen, murdered on the spot, uh, and he took his wagon into Austin and sold the cotton, sold the wagon, sold the team of horses. Or very near that spot, uh, there was a deputy sheriff that was murdered in the 1880s. And when you look at the whole thing and you do the investigation, come to find out that people in that area had found a grave of a person and they told their kids, oh, well, that is a guy named Maurice Moore who was a cotton farmer, so let's cover his grave up. So they covered his grave up. Actually, Maurice Moore is the deputy sheriff that was killed and he's actually buried in Austin. So when I when I read I, I could go on forever from this book. It's, it's actually four stories yeah. that is now a contemporary ghost tale in Westlake, Texas. Uh, this four is your classic stories. folklore, isn't it? Yeah. It, it is turned into that. So you know when you run down the rabbit hole on a story that you're told, you know, don't be surprised what you find out because I spend a lot of time or I spent a lot of time at the Austin Research Society, the Historical Research Society, reading old, you know, you're not going to find police reports on that stuff. You're going to find that stuff in old newspapers. Yes. Right. Uh, because the cops back then, they didn't write a report. You know, they <laughs> they caught you, they kicked your ass and they been to jail or, or hung you or killed you or something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so you're not going to find the, the police reports. You might find some of the, the court records. Yes. Yeah. But a lot of times the court records are, he showed up to court, found him guilty, we hung him, mm. and we went to lunch. I, I love those old newspapers. It's, it's something that I use um, locally um, for some of the things we, we investigate. Um, and, you, and I love the way they reported things. They were so graphic in those days. <laughs> Yeah, they didn't they, hold back on detail, did they? No, they were quite quite gruesome, you know. So you can find out who fell down the stairs at, in a certain pub, you know, in in our village, <laughs> yeah. and it describes in great detail that you know the injuries that they succumbed to in in yeah. the end. But it, yeah, you'll it, know exactly which half of the brain was hanging out. <laughs> yeah. And and that's the thing that I look for is the alpha report. What is the first report? that this actually happened. Yeah. And that's the only way that you can go off of, you know, you have to decipher all the way back to exhaust all of your information on, okay, what was the real story on, on this particular thing? Mm. And, uh, and so I think that's really important. I think you're right. And, and I think um, a lot of investigators or, or, or ghost hunters, if, if, you, if you're just a, a, an events team, for example, that they do a lot of events in in our country with um, people, members of the public go along. They might never have been on an investigation before, so they don't know what to expect. And the first thing that many of them have said uh, when we've been on them is, um, "We don't know anything about this building uh, because um, it's bad. To, it's bad to research what happened here because it can influence." Um, the investigation and I, I've always thought that's wrong surely you should know exactly what you're going into how how do you know if you get a name that comes through how do you know what questions to ask to call out you know surely it makes more sense to research before you investigate um, so yeah you've confirmed yeah. that so, well, we, so we've had a lot of success um particularly with 
music we like to use a bit of music on our investigation so if we can find out a little bit about what kind of music that locations listen to and play a bit of that we've had some good reaction we get quite we? good well it, I know Lindsay's referring in, in particular to a place called Craggy Nos, which is near us, and um, a famous op- an Italian opera singer called Adelina Patti lived there. So in particular, we played a piece of Adelina Patti's music, and we did get some fantastic um, results from that. We, you know, it all, all seemed to kick off, and, and all the equipment started doing its stuff um in response to that so if you know if we hadn't if we hadn't have done that if we hadn't have found out she lived there we'd have had a flat night <laughs> yeah we, yeah. yeah right that and and you know that that falls back on i think there's a there's an idea of a ghost hunter yeah. a paranormal investigator and then i take it one further and say a, a, you know a paranormal detective, detective. or paranormal researcher yeah. I, I'm saying that just because that's <laughs> that falls in with my www.theparanormaldetective.com. Yeah. Uh, but it, I'm, I'm taking it to one one more level. Okay, so if you're a ghost hunter, you go into some place, you turn some equipment on, you walk around, see what you find. You don't know anything that is supposed to be there, what to expect, or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Then you have a par- paranormal investigator, which... They hear the ghost story. Uh, they might research a couple of things in town or whatever. They go to the location. Uh, they walk around at night, you know, film the st- thing, spend the night there, something like that, and they leave. Yeah. A, a paranormal detective or, or true researcher is going to spend, you know, weeks if not months researching all the possibilities and so that they can understand how to put the puzzle together. Mm-hmm. Because you're going to have pieces of all kinds of puzzle. And in order to try to make sense of it all, um, you're going to need all the information you can possibly get. Right. But, um, you know, there is also information overload, and you can get yourself just completely confused. Because <laughs> <laughs> you have so much stuff. Yeah. And, and one, I mean, one of the things I think um, is important to perhaps say is, you don't need a whole lot of money, do you, behind you? You don't need a lot of expensive equipment. Or, or do you? Am I, am I wrong? I mean, you know, no, you it's expensive, isn't it? We, you need the large Hedron Collider. You need the, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you know, the thing about it is, is uh, you, you research history. Yeah. And paranormal stuff has been happening since, since the beginning of time, right? Mm-hmm. Um, there's a, a theory on um, why, why are human beings the way that we are? I mean, we're born, and it seems like there is something that tickles our brain that we want to try to figure things out. Yeah. yeah. It seems like a majority of the other mammals that are around us, they're born and they're like, hey, uh, I want security, and I want some food, and I want to procreate that's what i want to do and that's pretty much all they do and they don't really think about hey well maybe we should build a house here you know maybe we should do this so it kind of makes you wonder you know where does this come from and you know the the folks on the strong religious vibe i was raised catholic i'm a recovering catholic now (laughs) And, and so I experience things from that perspective. I, I equate them to the things that I was taught, I was indoctrinated in. Um, and the funny thing is, is, is the religious people will look at the ghost hunters and go, well, that's sacrilegious, or that's not true, or y'all are being silly, when, in fact, uh, you know, um, as far as if, if, if we go to the Catholic side of it, the religious side of it will... I believe they have ghosts. They believe in spirits. They pray to the saints. Mm. Um, you know, when, when you when you go and go do the Eucharist, uh, or, or you know, when when you as a Catholic you break break bread uh, during the Mass, well, that's transubstantiation. People don't realize that Catholics should believe because it's part of the dogma mm. that. The Eucharist, when when a priest prays over the Eucharist for the body and blood of Christ, he is actually turning that bread 
into the body of Christ and that blood into the blood or that wine into the blood of Christ. Mm. That is the belief in, in you know Catholicism. So mm -hmm. if you're a Catholic, you say, "Well, yeah, it's actually symbolistic." No, <laughs> that is not what it is. You can pretend like it is because it's 2017 and you think it's weird that you're eating the body and blood of Christ. Yeah. But if it's Catholic. That is transubstantiation. That is what the mystery of the Eucharist is. Yeah. And those folks will be the ones that will go, ah, you know, uh, you, you believe in aliens? That's silly. Yeah. It's like, well, wait a second. Hold on, you know. Yeah. Uh, there are actually other planets. I can't find heaven where you're talking about where these people are. <laughs> uh, you know, I actually have physical evidence of other planets. Do you have physical evidence? Yeah. And so it, gets, it, can, it can get really weird. So this whole idea of why we have this drive that we do falls back on a theory of, of perennialism. Where did this start? Um, you know, and that's what I'm talking about as far as the Alpha Report. Who was the first caveman that went, hey, I am me. Where did I come from? I came from my mom, but... Mm -hmm. Why am I here? You know, which, which, where did that start? But it started somewhere. Yeah. yeah. And it is extended. And you have uh, paranormal investigators today that, you know, people will roll their eyes go, oh, God, you know what? These people will think and everything. Hey, it's Sunday. I got to go to church. Mm -hmm. Wait a second. That's a mystery in and, of, in and of itself. It's just you're not in. You're not asking any questions. You're just. Yeah falling under true believer syndrome and going, okay, I'm going to follow whatever they tell me to do. Yeah. Yeah. You just act, they're just accepting something that they've been brought up to believe without questioning well, it. Yeah. And as far as the, the tools, maybe this is just a human thing. Maybe, maybe, um, maybe we have the tools in our brain. Uh, you know, we have a, a, a amygdalas. That's my favorite part of the brain not like my favorite to eat part of the brain but my favorite to eat part of the brain yeah um you know that thing is really cool it 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 helps us uh put shapes together that are dangerous to us like whenever you see something out of the corner of your eye that scares the heck out of you like a an extension cord you think it's a snake and you jump yeah. Well, yeah. well yeah thank you amygdala you just tried to help me yeah um, and and so Maybe it's a really suppressed part of our brain that we're not necessarily in tune to anymore. Mm -hmm. That yeah. these these feelings come up like what we started off with as far as, you know, I get in front of this person and I'm like, I got this feeling that they're lying to me. Yeah. I have no physical proof yet, no evidence yet, but I just, we started off on a bad foot because I got this feeling. Yeah. Well, maybe that's what it is. Maybe... Maybe uh, the the mystics or the mediums or clairvoyants have tuned into that part of their brain better than the rest of us. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe they're born with a gift, or maybe uh, they just got better at it. Just like if you were playing tennis, you know, the first time you tried to hit a tennis ball, mm -hmm. it, it you know went completely over the fence, and you know it, it takes a lot of practice. Well. Maybe it takes a lot of practice paying attention to those subtle clues that your spirit or your essence or your physical brain is trying to tell you, hey, this is something other than what you think it is. Yeah. So I don't know. The I don't think the equipment's that important. I, I tell people to put your damn equipment away. Leave it in the car. Go in and have the experience, man. Yeah. Pay attention. I see people... You know, they sp they they'll they'll spend all kinds of money to go into a castle, yeah, and spend you know uh, four hours in the castle and and three and a half hours are staring at a meter. Yeah, yeah. What are you doing? There could be a ghost dancing right in front of them, and they're looking at a meter. <laughs> That's they, uh, yeah. all the times that they've been using a K two meter. Has anybody found a ghost? <laughs> they might think <laughs> they have. They might well, yeah, I, and, and, <laughs> yeah, and until I can get a ghost in the room and get my K2 meter and, and go over there and go, okay, I got a ghost, this is how my K2 meter 
uh, behaves when I have a ghost. This is how my K2 meter behaves when I don't have a ghost. Okay, now I have a good measurement. <laughs> but until I can actually perform that experiment, uh, you know, that experiment, um, get your eyes off of your meter. Yeah. Pay attention to what's going on around you. That's my opinion. I, I couldn't agree more with you. I totally am I'm of that line of thinking. I know Lindsay is as well. We, you know, yeah. we, we've had, we don't have a lot of, of posh equipment. We, you know, we, if we go on investigations in groups, you know, we'll borrow theirs, but we've got the basics, the spirit boxes and things. I have to say we, more often than not, we just ditch them and go for the experience. And whenever, whenever we've experienced anything, it's, it's certainly not really been with, with equipment, you know, we've no. seen, seen things and heard things and felt things that are, I would say were the paranormal. Uh, I think I think the electronics, the uh, the iPads, the computers, every, everything we have in, in our society is actually numbing that sense. I think it's, I think, I think you're right, Greg. I think we're, we're losing it, it, it aren't uh, we? We are. Sorry, it's like um, it's like the Facebook thing, isn't it? I mean, you, you can scroll through your Facebook feed and you can see um, horrific uh, crime or horrific incident and your natural senses are fight or flight, but you're just scrolling past and, and you kind of you kind of learn to switch off these these natural instincts just through technology. Yeah, and and it's it's very obvious um, that people learn more through experience than they do through you know academic study. Academic study is huge. I I, I went back to, to school to get my master's degree in education, and I specialized in complex adaptive systems, which is how to look at different uh, facets of uh, a, any kind of uh, organization or experience and see how that organization or experience affects other organizations and experiences so I, I think academic study is huge i think it's very important to be able to understand and understand theory because you know um people in the united states they saw ghost hunters on tv and they go out and buy a bunch of equipment and then start running around looking for farmhouses and stuff to go experience this and they think they're doing something new well it it <laughs> It's been going on forever. It was, it was going on back in the 1700s in the United States. It's Western esotericism. It, it has to do with, uh, you know, a very small group of people studying a very specific type of thing and learning to understand, uh, you know, a, a very unique situation. And it's been going on forever. You can research this stuff like crazy, but people don't tend to do the research. They just pick up a meter and, and, or a video camera or, a, you know, a, a tape recorder and run out and do something, and they think they're doing something, you know, that's new. Well, yeah. th this has been going on for a long time, but all this equipment, you, all you have to do is have a conversation with a 15-year-old and realize that their capacity to communicate is incredibly diminished compared to when I was a kid. Um yeah. And I, I say that I'm 53, and we talked to each other. We communicated uh, verbally in front of each other, maybe over a, a, a telephone, yeah. uh, maybe over a radio, but we had human interaction. And you look at the kids that uh, have been born and have never not known the Internet, have never yeah. not known cell phones, have never not known text and Snapchat and Facebook and everything else that's Instagram and everything else that they're using. They have a different way to communicate, and it is very obvious that the uh, ability to articulate themselves is it, very, very diminished. Yes. Uh, because you have them in a, you know, because I, I go back to, to, to get my degree and I'm in my late 40s. Um, the the night no the 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 twenty to twenty five year olds that I was in class with I was amazed at the ridiculous arguments that they would come up with and 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 it really was it was just an argument argue not an argument of logic or uh, you know positive interaction it was just a 
this is the way I perceive life and that's the way the world is. Well, it's not. People have huge diversities of, of perception and think about now doing electronics, I can automatically call out the people I don't want to listen to. Mm. You know, the only people that are on my Facebook page are people I agree with. Mm. So all the other people that, you know, are, are are doing whatever they're doing on Facebook, I'm not listening to them. Yeah. And I don't have interaction with them, so I don't have that exposure and I don't have that contemplative time to say, wow, that person mm. um, had a good argument for this. And that's why I think it has a lot to do with the United States and the political system on how divided we are. I mean, we, United States is divided down the center, yeah. 50%, you know, 48 to 52%, something like that, either we're liberal or we're conservative. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're conservative, you have a liberal friend on Facebook, you unfollow them, and all you do is listen to your yeah. conservative stuff. And yeah. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, I've seen some, some, some arguments and some, you know, people fall out. And it, it's, a, it's a shame. That, you know, they're not prepared to... Li- because, you know, what, to- I, at, at work, yeah, I'm a supervisor at work, and I'm a disruptive supervisor. That's, I, I, I'm, I'm not a Unitarian. I'm a disruptive <laughs> supervisor. I get people thinking, and I get people talking and arguing out the problem. Mm. I don't go, hey, we have this problem. I think it should be handled this way. What do you think? And everybody goes, yeah, yeah, that's what I want. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And we go do it and, and you know, it all falls apart. I want to know everybody's input yeah. to, to see what, you know, what might be a better solution to this. Yeah. And, uh, and it's, it, you know, it's, it's really unfortunate because I've lost friends on Facebook the last elections. Uh, just because they drew a line down down the center and said either you're either with me or against me, which is completely yeah. ridiculous. It's completely ridiculous. because most of the stuff that happens in the world uh, does not determine whether uh, it you know we're we're solving everything just based on this particular mm-hmm. one thing or we're destroying it. Most likely, most of the the decisions we make during the day are you know benign and aren't going to affect the world yeah so, and so when we're talking paranormal stuff and you have a different perspective it's amazing how vicious that we can be amongst each other oh yeah and <laughs> yeah we've all witnessed that at some point haven't we yeah i'll bring up pareidolia it's very common outside of um you know the paranormal thing where we automatically see uh images of perspective on certain things because we have an expectation, we have an internal narrative of the way that we think the world is, and we lay back and look at the clouds and go, hey, there's a dog. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, there, there's President, you know, President George Washington. There's a sandwich. It's a sandwich. <laughs> I, I had that today. Um, I opened a pack of um, margarine spread, and there was a smiley emoji face in the middle of the spread. I saw that. <laughs> it's on my Facebook page. There That's is. what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there's been cheese sandwiches with the Virgin Mary go for big money here. In the <laughs> state, <so. laughs> that has pieces of toast with um, Jesus Christ's face on. I've seen. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, so. you know what, Greg? I can't believe we've been talking for nearly two, well over two hours. It's just got, it's sad. absolutely flown by. Um, it's sad. If people if people want to read more, can can you tell us website address? Well, it, it, if my website's working, it, it, it is, is working now. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> www.theparanormaldetective.com or www.authorgreglawson.com and 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 I do some some uh, fiction stuff too, just just for fun. Um, yeah. And is so, that what you're working on right now? So- uh, right now, I'm. Uh, I had a uh, um, a publishing company get with me um, about a book that I wrote a few years ago called The Carrion, which is uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly or not, yeah. but not like chaos, but the carrion, like rotten meat, yeah, like animal okay. inside of it. That's right. Yeah, and so uh, 
some disturbed person read that and went, oh, man, they, they need to republish that. So anyway, we, we're going through a, a, uh, uh, a, a new edit on that and kind of updating it a little bit because when I originally wrote it, we were uh, using a rotary dial telephones, I think, or something like that. So we had to uh, update it a little bit with uh, cell phones and things like that. So we are going through that. I'm, I think they're going to release that in July I'm expecting it to the July date. The same company pulled up my old book, The Disorient Express, uh, and kind of went, went back through that. And uh, our, that's just got republished. So it's out there. And then the, the Detecting Paranormal book uh, is my serious uh, approach on investigating paranormal incidences. And, and it's it, my, my, that Detecting Paranormal book is more designed for if you consider yourself a paranormal investigator, you probably, uh, this book will probably help you. Yes. Um, if you're just getting into it, it might be a little overwhelming because I go into some pretty in-depth stuff. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to be in, uh, I'm going to be in Warwick, uh, oh. in September. Ah. I'm speaking, uh, I'm speaking at the, uh, uh, the Sage Paracon over there on Saturday. I think it's September 28th. Fantastic. Yeah, I was okay. looking at that earlier on Facebook. I was I actually worked out it would just take us less than two hours to get there, Lindsay, mm, if we drove. Yeah. So we you never know, Greg, we might see you there because we um we love the, the paranormal conventions and they're just fantastic for networking with people and you get to learn so much in in a weekend. It's Yes. Well I I I know MJ Dixon. Um and she, she's the one that's putting on, and, and I've known her, I don't know, I, I met her at the uh, Ireland Paracon, um, so I don't know how many years, three years, four years, something like that, but she's been absolutely wonderful, uh, you know, coordinating stuff. She works, she works really hard. <laughs> and so, um, the, the last one, uh, we, we were at uh, Walksall Abbey, it was really, really cool. Yeah. And I think I'm pronouncing that right, right? Walksall Abbey? I yeah, know. I think that's right. Yes. Uh, I, I was actually speaking, so you guys are in Wales, right? Yes, that's right. South Wales. Okay. I was speaking with a uh, an anthropologist slash, I don't know if she was an anthropologist, or I guess she was an anthropologist. Right. Um, and she was working, do you guys have a bunch of coal mines in Wales? Yeah, we okay. sure do. <laughs> okay, she was hired by the government to identify where these mines are because apparently it's very dangerous in Wales because um, they've been mining coal there for hundreds of years or maybe thousands of years. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so there's holes all over the place. That's there true. Are, yeah. But there's and, an awful lot of natural caves as well. So it's not just the mining. Yeah. There's natural holes. So the government hired her to map and identify uh, coal mines. Right. that were there from the, you know, the prior 1800s and stuff. So mm -hmm. she went up there and she found lots of bodies. Oh. Uh, and, and she was actually at a paranormal, she was very uncomfortable. She was at a paranormal convention um, because she had these experiences and it really affected her. Wow. Uh, and she she quit working for, for that organization uh, because, I mean, she was like, you know, finding children because they used children back then. They were yeah. smaller, yeah, they did. and so she had found children that were. You know, if you're in a cave, if you're in a coal mine, and, and there's a cave in, mm -hmm. um, the coal that's all around you kind of uh, um, uh, pr pr preserves you. Yes. So she's digging around, and she finds this stuff. You know, and she, at the time she's young, and I, I think she's. I think she. I know she has a master. I think she has a PhD. Yeah. Um, and and so she, she, her and her husband were at this parent paranormal <laughs> conference, and she just kind of sitting there, you know. She doesn't want to damage her credibility because I mean, she's, she yeah. works in in industry that that really matters. But she's you know was ex anyway. So that that was fascinating to me. Yeah, uh, and I need to I need to uh, get her email, and I need to send that to you because you definitely. Guys, look her up and, and talk to her. I don't know whether she will uh, uh, come on the show or not, but I'm, 
I think you'd really like talking with her. We would absolutely love to talk to her because we're right in in South Wales, in the valleys, where all the coal mines are. I mean, we've got... um, there's one huge pit that's they they've actually opened it up as, as a museum. It's called Big Pit in Blenavon, and that's so she, was, she was working in part of that. That's right. It's, she had a lot to do with information that they have and stuff like that. She oh, did. we would love to speak. Oh, to her. she's got to come on our show. Yeah, find, please find her for us, Greg, because she okay, she will. will be. You know, oh, that would be fantastic. She was wonderful to talk to. So right. Right. Yes, yeah, so 28th page, uh, Sage Paracon at Warwick. It's going to be fun. It's going to be awesome. And then uh, I'm going to be with Dave Schrader. We're doing a eight day tour around a whole yeah. bunch of castles and and doing a whole bunch of stuff. Oh, there. I heard him about that. So you're yeah. going to be involved with that. Oh, I'm really jealous. Yeah. I want. To, I would would love to come along on that. It's going to be great. <laughs> it's going to be fantastic. We'll maybe, certainly be listening maybe, in. Yeah. I don't know how close we're going to get. I don't. We go do whatever, and then in, in that night we go out to eat or whatever. Maybe y'all can join us if you're close. Yeah, and, oh, that's great. And I'm in Michigan at the Michigan Paracon. That's that's like one of the big ones in the United States. The you know like Chicago Paracon is pretty good, big, and you have you know uh, Salem the Salem Witch Festival. Uh, Mothman is Mothman is more festivalist. Yeah, right, it's right. more you know food and and doing stuff like that yeah um the the michigan paracon is pretty hardcore serious people going up there because it's, it's hard to get to to begin with it's in it's way up there mm. and uh, so you have to you have to either drive a long way to get in there or take a flight in there but it's one of the biggest ones i've, I've done before and i'm gonna i'm gonna be there august 12th through the 23rd on friday i'm speaking about what causes a haunting and then on Saturday, I'm doing a workshop on evaluating paranormal evidence. So that's going to be fun. Oh, that sounds amazing. Yeah. That sounds just fantastic. Well, we, would would you come on our show again, Greg, or have, have we put you off? Or <laughs> would, you, <laughs> would you come and talk to us again? Because it's just no. been fascinating. No, I think this is it. This is going to be better. Yeah. So many oh, things I wanted to ask you. I could talk all night, honestly. Or let you <laughs> talk all night. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Cats. We could talk about cats. I'm quite happy to talk about cats. I think night. we could easily do a whole show on cats. Cats easily. and uh, Nutella sandwiches, and we're we're good. Yeah. Well, well, that that reminds me. There's just one very important question I ask you before you go. Before we say goodbye, Greg. Um, say goodbye. Before we say goodbye. Okay. Can, can I ask you, what are you having for your tea tonight? Oh, what am I have? I think I'm have. Pretty sure we're having uh, enchiladas with uh, charro beans and rice, uh, fresh hand-done tortillas with some really beautiful avocado and uh, some shredded, I think, sharp cheddar cheese. <gasps> oh, that's all. that sounds amazing. Hey, we never have avocado and... Mm. Posh stuff like that sounds really nice. My mouth mm-hmm. is now watering. Yeah, you know, we most of the avocados that we get in Texas come up from uh, Central America, oh. and so when they put them out, yeah, ha- unfortunately, the transport you have to eat them within two days. They ripen really quick. Yeah, right. But they're they're really really. Good. I want to come to your house for tea now. I you think so. Y'all you, know if you ever make it to Texas, I will be your uh, paranormal tour guide in Austin <laughs> and in San Antonio. San Antonio has great down there as far as paranormal stuff. Um, you know, one thing we didn't talk about is Roswell, so you're going to have to call me back. And, oh, uh, gosh. And I want to, to do- talk. Yeah, yeah, I want to talk to you more in depth about Roswell because there's just so much. I think that's like a whole show all on its own. Mm. Um, uh, several shows, actually. If yeah. You know, but it's. It's volumes and volumes of of just craziness. I mean, no one. It's taken you thirteen years, so it has there has to be volumes and volumes of it. That's a, that's a lot of podcasts. <laughs> I assure you, there's a lot of it. There's, I'm pretty sure there's probably a podcast nothing but Roswell. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So that could be our podcasts done for the rest of the year, couldn't it? Mm. We could. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> the the Roswellian syndrome. <laughs> the 
Roswellian syndrome. <laughs> I have. Uh, I also have. Um, um, I have a friend of mine that she does a bunch of um, metal detecting. Mm. Oh yeah. I've been working with her a little bit. It's pretty amazing the stuff that she finds. And uh, so we're working on a project on the San Gabriel River where uh, there were three Spanish missions down here in the 1740s. And, uh, and they all got wiped out by the Indians. And uh, one of the priests was murdered by one of the soldiers that was in the mission and all this stuff. And so her and I are uh, working real hard uh, trying to identify what is called the Brook of the Souls. That's what the Spanish called it. And it was where the then San Xavier River ran into um, what's called the Brook of the Souls. Mm -hmm. And that's where the, uh, the Spanish uh, friars, the, the, the priests, would take the Indians to baptize them. Ooh. And I have figured out where it is. And so me and this friend of mine, we're, we're kind of getting an expedition going because all the land around it is privately owned and we can't get on it, but we can get in the river. The river is very small. It's a sm very small river. Yeah. But we're going to do a little back adventure down there with uh, metal detectors and, uh, and all that, and I'm going to kind of uh, do the paranormal thing there also because, you know, like I said, the – what causes a haunting? Well, mm. imagine a bunch of Indians that are massacring people. Imagine, you know, priests there that are getting killed by the soldiers that are supposed to be there to protect them. Mm. Uh, you know, rapes, all kinds of stuff that were going on there. Mm. Yeah. And so it, it should be fairly interesting. And, and once again, you know, is, is, is the paranormal events and and things happening even though human beings aren't there or does yeah. it a human being there to actually perceive it that's that interesting like, yeah you know yeah. so anyway we're going to be working on that in the next couple of months that sounds fascinating well, so will that be uh how will you up will you put that up on facebook i'm gonna i'm gonna I'm going to do uh, some uh, some videos on it. Mm -hmm. uh, I did a video. I don't know if you know, saw the video I did on uh, the Tonka was. Oh yeah, on your page. Uh, yeah, that's that that site there is amazing. There are bodies buried all over that place. Wow. Um, and uh, that place just got condemned and purchased by the government, and they put up a huge fence around it and. No passing sign, so you can't get back on that. Right. Yes, yeah, so that's that's a really good thing that they did, and hopefully um, they'll either keep it like that or they'll turn it into some sort of because the artifacts there are pretty cool, all the the, the fire mounds and everything. Because it, it, it it could be a couple of hundred years old or it could be a few thousand years old. It's so pretty, so they're pretty worried old. about people. Um just going in there and digging it all up and, and yeah, damaging and that's it. What it. That's what had been happening. Uh, because, I mean, you walk across that place and there's tools laying around, hide scrapers, wow. uh, you know, mortar and pestles, all kinds of stuff just laying all over the place out there. Mm. Those, those people lived there for hundreds of years and then just left. Or the white people, you know, killed them all and drove them out of yeah. there. Yeah. Oh, oh, wow. And you've been, you've been there. That's just, yeah, that's that. that I, I've that been there too. multiple times, kind of, uh, because I, I wanted to find out that sure that there were graves there, and it took me about fifteen minutes, and I found one. You know, wow, right? There, there are thousands of them all over there, yeah. and uh, and I'm pretty sure there were they were Tonkawa Indians that were doing it, just because they had stayed there. Tonkawas are Indians known to be um, kind of the lower end of the Indian. Perspective, uh, spectrum as far as right. motivation and intelligence. They kind of just hung out and did whatever they wanted to do. They weren't like Comanches or Apaches or yeah. some of the other ones that were really uh, assertive and, and moved around a lot. So It's interesting pretty, how you, how you, um, it, you know, is that quite close to where you live? All this, yeah, all this? yeah. You feel a, and, and a bit of a... An affinity in some way, don't you? When something's happened in your area, it gives you 
all the more it makes it all the more interesting to to investigate if you like it's perhaps your ancestors or right it, it gives you some sort of ownership to you know there were people but i'm sitting in a in a in a house on a street and i think you know we discovered this place and built a house no uh, about about a 10 minute drive from where i am there's a place called the Galt site. And the Galt site uh, is a Paleolithic Indian site that may date to 3,200, I'm sorry, 32,000 right. years ago. Right. Um, they have Clovis points, which are Indian arrowheads, kind of. Yeah. Uh, that date to 16,000 years ago. So okay. that changes. That changes the history of America because, um, you know, we've always been taught in the United States that uh, when the Ice Age brought the level of the oceans down, mm -hmm. the Asians from, you know, from, from Western Asia migrated across the Beringi Land Bridge into now Alaska, Canada, and then worked their way down into uh, you know, across the plains of the United States and possibly migrated into the Mexico area, and that's what where the Aztecs and Incas came from. Yeah. Well, that, that theory dates about 6,000 years. Well, we're finding, you know, items in the Galt site in Texas that date past 16,000 years ago. So that completely rewrites history on us. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank That's you was, ever so that. much for talking to us. It's been an absolute pleasure. Mine too. Any any <laughs> time you. you want to talk, just hit me up. We sure will. We'll keep in touch with you on Facebook. And uh, again, thank you very much. Yeah, very well. thank you, Thanks Greg. Thank I you. enjoyed it. Thank you all. Good. Good night. Good night. Thank <laughs> you.